extend to you the grace and mercy and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ this morning as we wind down the season of Epiphany with the celebration of the transfiguration of Christ. Epiphany begins with revealing Jesus Christ to the wise men. Twelve days after Christmas, January 6th, we celebrate the event where Gentiles lay their eyes on Christ for the first time. And then the stories of the Gospels lead up to more revelation about who Jesus is. Until we get to this point, the high point of the revelation, Jesus Christ is revealed as God in his glory. And then from today, we move down back into the valley of the shadows of sorrow and death with Ash Wednesday. So we go from the high point of Christ to his low point as after the transfiguration, he enters into the city of Jerusalem to suffer and die. With this in mind, we'll be looking at Psalm chapter 2 today. Please join me in prayer. Father, we are thankful, Lord, that Jesus Christ is our Redeemer, but he is also our King. Many times, O Lord, we seek to rebel against our King. We are thankful that when this acts of rebellion take place, you call us to repentance. Drive us to our knees. Help us to recognize, O oh Lord, that obedience to the King is more for our welfare than for His. And that, as we see in Psalm 1, we find happiness and joy in following His counsels and directions which He gives for our life, the one who has created us. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Friends in Christ, I have a little story with you to share with you in my childhood today. There are some impressionable childhood memories that never leave you. One that I remember was when I started first grade in Red Lake Falls, Minnesota. When you became a first grader, it meant that you were going to learn an entire different location and building. A lot of snow in Minnesota, snow had again fallen in that town, and the custodians of the school had shoveled a nice pile of snow on the concrete plaza before the school doors. When it came to school that day, I, I saw some kids playing the game King of the Hill on top of that pile. There was a young boy who was older than me and bigger than me who, who was the king, and, and nobody was dethroning him. I watched the game from the side, and I didn't understand why nobody could beat him. He, he seemed not that overpowering. I decided to give my best shot, the new kid on the block. Who knows? I thought with my physical prowess, quickness and coordination. I could take him. Take him down. Become king. And win the approval of many. You know how it is, right? Whenever you start a new school, it's hard to make friends, be well liked. This was my chance to shine. I climbed the hill that day. The conquest didn't take long. With a strong push to the upper body, the king went down. I stood up on top of the hill that day, prouder than a peacock, I thumped my chest and said, I am the king of the hill. Shortly after that announcement, I felt a metal lunchbox hit me on the back of my head. <laughs> the blow knocked me out for a couple of seconds. When I woke up, a much bigger student, who I never understood why he had not dethroned the king earlier, I think it was his brother, looked me straight in the eye and said, nobody knocks Donnie off the hill. I learned a rule of school that day. It wasn't a rule made by school administrators, but one established by the Washington Elementary Student Society. You see, Donnie was a special needs student. The game was a way to make Donnie feel better about himself, and the contestants better about themselves as they helped Donnie grow in his confidence by winning victory after victory after victory. Needless to say, I never played that game again with them. I walked away that day knowing that the new kid on the block had some more street learning to do. When we look at Psalm chapter 2, we see that God has established a king on the hill. Today on Transfiguration Sunday, we see the glory of that king on a hill which many people think took place on Mount Tabor. Not really sure if it happened there, but just a good, strong, solid guess. But in Psalm chapter 2, the hill is specifically mentioned of where the king is established. I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Zion is the hill in Jerusalem where they built the temple. So Zion has significant meaning to the readers of the Old Testament as being a high holy place. And on that 
hill of Zion, God has established his king, which we understand to be Jesus Christ. Over the course of time, though, people have rebelled against the king. In Psalm chapter 2, the kings of the world are encouraged to fear the king and be obedient to the king. They need to understand that if you are a king or a president or a governor in this world, you have been given special privilege. And like that line in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. God says to the kings of this world, handle the power I give to you responsibly. And the best way to do that is to make sure you honor my son, who is the authority of the world and gives to you the power to rule. Kiss the son, they ought to say, and honor and fear the son. But you look throughout the world today and you think about the many kings we have. For one of those I, I struggle with is, is Putin. I still just struggle with this individual. I understand that he may be Russian Orthodox. But is he one of those kings that has dethroned, his, dethroned the king from his conscience? Because when you have Jesus as your king, he's going to limit your conscience. He's going to limit what you can do and not do. He's going to put boundaries on your territory and your governance. And yet you see with Putin that he seems to have no problems with killing many Ukrainian civilians and Ukrainian soldiers. No problems with sacrificing the sons of Russian mothers for the expansion of his territory. Is he dethroning the king from his conscience? There was another individual in China years ago, 250 B.C. This is not a guy that was a Christian, but he was a guy that... Uh, definitely struggled with anything that restricted his morality. It was the Quinn dynasty. And the teachings that were restricting his morality back then was Confucianism. You might be aware of Confucius. He wrote a lot of moral codes, but all the moral codes worked against the Quinn dynasty. He could not expand his territory when all these people were listening to him and saying, you're wrong, Quinn. You are not running the country correctly. And to just get rid of that charge, to dethrone the king, he buried alive, legend says, 450 Confucius scholars, burned all of his books so he could have freedom to do what he wanted to do. Dethrone the king of his conscience, the king of morality. Now, we can look at various kings, like I said, the Quinn dynasty and what Putin is doing, but let's look at ourselves personally in the mirror. Is there sometimes with our words and our behaviors, our actions, that we are dethroning the king of the hill because we just find him too restrictive? He limits us. He limits our freedom. We are convinced by Satan and our sin. And even we see this situation in things like Disney's movie Frozen, where that girl says, no right, no wrong, no rules for me. Want a, want a party? Is there no right? Is there no wrong? Are there no rules for me? Do we want to dethrone the king of our conscience and do what we and our sinful nature wishes to do? Years ago, I think it was back in 1988-89, uh, I took our confirmation kids to this uh, youth retreat in Valpo University. The main speaker that day was Terry Dittmer. He was the uh, synodical youth chair person. And he had a speech and he started off with this question. This is the question he asked. How many of you students in confirmation know the Ten Commandments by heart? Well, I was proud that day because my kids did. And he was surprised that even some of the kids from our church knew the Ten Commandments. Most of the other kids, the 150, couldn't even raise their hands. And he had this to say, it's a shame. Why is it a shame? Because you will be entering a world where you will need to be making moral decisions. And if you have no moral framework, how will you be able to make the right call? You're going to end up this way. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. 
unless you have that moral framework embedded into your heart to know what you should do. We struggle with Christ restricting our freedom as sinners. Sometimes we do what we want to do. We do things that are definitely contrary to his will. And by our words and actions, might you not be hearing yourself saying yes to this question of Pontius Pilate? Not that, I'm sorry, thank you, Myron, I want to stay there. It goes back to the time of Adam and Eve of this rebellion, where Satan says, you don't need God, dethrone God. He convinces Adam and Eve, you can make your decisions of good and evil. You can make your own morality. You don't need God to tell you what's right and wrong. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. It goes all the way back to that time. And therefore, you see Adam and Eve saying this, and ourselves, let us break their chains and throw off their fetters. We're talking God's chains, God's fetters, as if his moral structures are imprisoning us rather than helping us to live in proper freedom. That's what Psalm 2, 3 says. Even the kings struggle with this moral structures of God. They want their freedom. They want to do what they want to do without having God saying, you are violating the boundaries of morality. Stay within. And now, again, to the point I was saying, with our own personal lives, when we struggle with our own behavior towards God and our own thoughts, might we not be answering yes to this question of Pilate? Shall I crucify your king? And we say yes, because he's restricting me. Crucify him, we say. We many times are yelling with those people on that original Good Friday, crucify our king because he restricts us. What are the results and consequences of dethroning the king? Do you get hit over the head with a metal lunchbox? One of the results, according to Psalm chapter 2, is, is this. It brings laughter from God. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He doesn't understand why you think he can actually dethrone his king. And any and all attempts that you make to dethrone his king and dethrone the king in your conscience, he laughs at it. It's not going to be successful. You're set up for failure. It is an exercise of futility. It is not going to happen. And the greatest laughter that took place when the king was crucified took place on Easter. Can you not hear God laughing on the resurrection? The movie The Ten Commandments, maybe you're familiar with that. Yul Brynner playing Pharaoh, Charlton Heston playing Moses. Can't remember, I think it was Deb Kerr who played Nefertiti. Nefertiti. And as the people of Israel were allowed to leave Egypt, I remember this line which sticks with me to this day, where the queen says to Pharaoh, Do you hear laughter, Pharaoh? On Easter, I think the devil was hearing a lot of laughter. God laughs at those who seek to dethrone his king. He cannot be dethroned. All efforts are futile. And yet throughout our life, we still struggle with letting Jesus be our king not fully understanding that his laws are really for our welfare and our benefit. And that violation of them brings us more harm than good. That's what the Psalm chapter 2 basically, basically sells to us too. Is another consequence is, I'll just read it right out of here, that uh, um, worship the Lord with reverence, rejoice with trembling, do how much of the sun becomes Henry because you perish in the way. In other words, when you dethrone the king, you lead yourself to self-destruction. There was a guy back in the 1900s, his name was Nietzsche. He's a philosopher. He not only dethroned the king, he basically said the king was dead. God is dead! What did he mean by that? He meant do whatever you want. There is no God to control you anymore. You're free! Go live your life! The ends justify the means. 
Whoever has the most toys at the end of the game wins the game. It doesn't matter how you get the toys, just get them. His philosophy created the movement of nihilism, which is self-destruction. There is no meaning to life. And so really, when a nihilist lives his life, it leads him to self-destruction. Nitschke said, God is dead. Live your life for freedom. Do whatever you want. Be the Superman. What he meant is the Superman is the one that wins the game at the end. However you get to be the Superman, he doesn't care. Just do it. Nitschke, in other words, is... Grand Theft Auto on steroids. You ever think about that game? Of how that's influencing the minds of our children? Because it doesn't matter how you get the car, just get the car! If you have to kill, steal, knife, get the car! Grand Theft Auto on steroids. That's nihilism. When we look throughout the rest of Psalm chapter 2, it ends with this encouragement. The kings of the world are told to kiss the sun. They are told to kiss the sun out of fear, out of reverence. Again, with great power comes great responsibility. They need to understand that they are giving power to serve their neighbor and not themselves. Remember your place in life. Kiss the sun. For us as Christians, we do not kiss the sun because we are afraid. We kiss the sun because we love. We know his history. We know his story. Through Calvary, he has died and rose again from the dead so that we might have faith and reunion with God for eternity. We kiss the sun and we see the oracles of Christ that are helpful for our life. It is, as what Psalm 1 has to say, the preceding psalm, The delight of the Christian is in the law of the Lord. For there he meditates day and night. Because his laws bring happiness, not sorrow. We therefore are moved by God's love to kiss the sun. There may be times, though, where in our life we may get rebellious, just like any student, any teenager with a parent rebel against the father, the mother. And when that happens, it's not surprising. I'm very thankful for the metal lunchbox that God hits me over the head with called the law. He knocks me to my knees and says to me, nobody knocks my son off the hill. But after he tells me about the law, he gives me the gospel. Forgiveness and grace extends his hands to me to take me up from my knees and welcomes me as another child who he beloves. We kiss the Son because of the grace and the mercy that we experience through the Son, Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. Now may the peace of God which surpass all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Heard the words of a man.